Hi, I'm Larry Chang, co-founder and managing partner of Volition Capital. Welcome to Flash Feedback, where we look at real pitch decks from real companies. And I try and give you a behind the scenes tour of what an investor is really thinking and what they're seeing as they walk through your deck. And in every episode, we will look at one company and I will walk through their deck very quickly, the same way I would do a first pass through a deck if it came to me. And I'll try and give you some ideas of what, what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing, but also end each episode with two or three key takeaway points that can help you prepare your own pitch deck as you think about your business. Today, I'm very excited to share with you the pitch deck from the Tree Center. I wanna thank the team there for volunteering their deck for this episode. Uh, it's actually a really good deck, I think, very clear, very concise. And actually, when I saw this deck last year, I got very excited about the business. I wanted to learn more, and that's all you can really ask for uh, from a pitch deck. So we're gonna dive in. Before I do that, as always, if you wanna submit your pitch deck for feedback, you can do that at volitioncapital.com. And if you want to see other episodes of Flash Feedback, feel free to subscribe to this YouTube channel. But let's dive into the Tree Center's pitch deck. All right, let's dive into the deck. I want to frame our analysis of this deck with a very simple question, which is, what are the two or three missed opportunities you see for Tree Center to go deeper on a couple of topics? Um, again, I, as I mentioned, this is a, a great overall deck uh, and it engendered my enthusiasm. But they dipped their toe in the water on a couple of topics that I think they could have gone deeper on. So let's look out for those missed opportunities in an otherwise very strong deck. All right, first page. Start out strong with your best metric. They are starting out with their revenue growth, revenue history, revenue scale. Fantastic story, 5 million to 22 million to 50 million. Um, so that's great. I think it's always advisable to put your best metrics up front. And then they talk about acreage, which is actually a new metric for me. I haven't seen acreage in a pitch deck, so it seems to follow revenue. Um, I think they could have perhaps put in a little bullet point on what acreage means in this business. I presume it's manufacturing or fulfillment capacity. But nonetheless, I think starting with your best metric up front is, is always a good idea. Next problem statement, which is that the local nursery is not a great experience for consumers. Driving, parking, lifting plants, dirty cars etc. Um, I always think it's great to put your value proposition statement early because it's fundamentally why you exist and the Tree Center exists to solve this problem, which I think many of us probably identify with. And then they come with their solution, which is a, a much easier consumer experience, um, massive selection delivered to your door and so forth. My only suggestion for the value prop section here is to the degree you can quantify your value, it makes it a stronger overall statement. So if you have a selection advantage, can you quantify that? Uh, if you have a pricing advantage, can you quantify that? You know, anything to give it more substance um, is great. But either way, whether you can quantify it or not, sticking your value prop up early is uh, is a good idea. <clears throat> All right, fourth slide. It, this slide looks to me to be somewhat redundant in in reviewing the revenue and acreage history that was just presented a few slides earlier. So I don't know how this is additive other than to reinforce an already strong point. So I might have used this real estate in the deck for a more complimentary point. All right, why now? Uh, I, I love us, by the way, I love slide titles that are just a question that is answered. Uh, and this is a great question, which is why does this business exist today? And I think they're saying that consumers are willing to buy most things online. Shipping has become affordable. And um, so it's now economic to do this. Uh, and this is where I think there's a first missed opportunity. Um, I think they could have gone deeper right here to, to um, articulate one of their stronger points, which is, um, and this is my, my overall suggestion, is to make the success of your business feel inevitable. Um, rather than just making a general statement by saying consumers are willing to buy everything online, I might have shown every you know, 10 consumer product categories and shown the winners of those categories. So you could have said, um, you know, pet food chewy was the winner. You could say uh, furniture, Wayfair, um, automobiles, uh, car gurus, uh, for collectibles and, and other artisan products, you could say it's Etsy. For shoes, you could say it's Zappos. For apparel, you could say it's Stitch Fix and others. And you could just sort of lay out a handful of consumer product categories, show that they all moved online, which reinforces the point being made here show, but in an additive way, show the winners are all billion or multi-billion dollar companies, and then show that really 
the the landscape products market is one of the last sort of untapped consumer product categories of substance where there is not a, a D to C e-com winner yet. And so in, you can make this, um, uh, you can sort of engender this sentiment of scarcity value where if you really want to invest in e-com, this is kind of one of the last open categories and it's sort of inevitable. Of course, there's going to be an e-com winner in this place. Uh, of course, that company is going to be worth a billion dollars or, or north. And you want to leave investor thinking like it's sort of a slam dunk, inevitable business. And um, and that's where I think they could have gone deeper. So point number one is make the success of your business seem inevitable. And the way you can do that is by sticking it squarely in sort of a tsunami of secular trends that are going in your favor. <clears throat> All right. Why now move to now market size? So I think this is a, a very nicely done slide. A lot of market size slides just have the high level number, which would be the $50 billion category here. But they do a nice job of segmenting into these three large categories of vegetables, herbs, indoor plants, and outdoor plants. Then they segment within it. And then they segment by what they offer and what they're not offering yet, which gives the sense that there's more growth ahead. So I, I like this segmentation. It's kind of the analysis that we would do anyways. And so they're laying it out. And ultimately, you're seeing that right now they're in this sort of $14 billion plus market. Um, and, um, and so I think it's, it's well done overall. A competition slide laying out uh, their direct uh, internet peer play competitors and as well as the, uh, the incumbents. And I think this is a good fair slide. What I would have wanted to see here is just some of the scale of what these companies are at. I mean, they talk about fast growing trees at 50 to 75, but how much is Home Depot's and Lowe's here generating in this market? It's always nice when you're investing in a business to have a clear target of who you're going against and who you want to beat. Uh, and in that sense, they might have framed it as Home Depot and Lowe's and maybe made some comment or uh, some re do some research on on why the Home Depot Lowe's experience is ultimately beat beatable. So it's for Tree Center to be a big company, they probably need to steal share from Home Depot, Home Depot and Lowe's. And this is your chance to say why you think you can do that. Visual of the product. Um, this is nice packaging. So I'm, I like that they showed it. This also shows that this is a, a direct to consumer brand, not a third party e-com business. So they're branding their products um, and uh, and it certainly looks better than the traditional nursery experience. Um, and they're demonstrating that um, there is a mobile and uh, sort of internet aspect to the business. I like the fact that they're pointing towards, again, near term expansion into other categories of plants in terms of edibles and indoors, but um, in your know, nice visual here. All right, a little bit on unit economics, uh, CAC LTV, two year LTV, average order values and so forth. I think this is the second area where they could have gone deeper and it's a bit of a missed opportunity. I'll explain why. Overall, I actually think these metrics are strong. $200 AOV is, is great. Um, $200 for a two year customer value, if it's on a margin basis, is a solid relative to their CAC. Um, but um, I think where they could have gone deeper, and I'll make this as a general statement, is if you have trend data that, is, that supports your narrative, that's a stronger uh, that's a stronger data point to use than sort of an individual point in time data. So use trend data instead of moment in time data. So for example, if customer acquisition cost is stable or declining, and that's the way it's been for two years, I would show the trend line on that because it it lends credence to the notion that your CAC is underwritable as an investor. Um, if your average order values are going up. Um, you know, show the trend line. If your gross margins are going up, show the trend line rather than a single data point. Um, if your LTVs are going up, show the trend line. And so ultimately you want to make the investor feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of volatility so that there's that some of the core metrics of this business are rock solid over time, going in the right direction. And that makes it underwritable for them. So um, again, this is a perfectly good slide. I've seen many like it. Uh, to the degree that the trend line history here uh, is is strong for the narrative, I would have shown that to make this an even more compelling slide. So take home point number two, 
is when the trend line supports your narrative, show the trend, not just an individual data point. All right, growth plan to 100 million of revenue. Uh, this is this is actually a, a great slide. I don't see it a lot in DEX. I, I think it could have been framed even better. So this is where my third opportunity is. But they're talking here about how they can expand to the West Coast. They can expand additional categories. They can expand their inventory uh, and obviously expand acquisition channels for reach. And so I, I think they've done a nice job laying out what the growth levers are. And what I would have just suggested is to quantify the impact. So, um, so point number three is show that your business has many growth levers that can drive significant revenue expansion. Um, and so you want to leave the investor feeling like they don't have to, the company doesn't have to hit on all of these growth levers. Um, but if they do, it's a huge home run. And if they hit on most of them, it's still a huge home run. So it doesn't feel like you're single threaded and that there's one or two growth levers and you have to nail them or else the business isn't going to work. And so I think they've done that here. My suggestion would be is just to quantify it. So if you expand to the West Coast, and what would that have meant to revenue this year? It would have doubled or tripled. Um, if you had more inventory and you could afford that with capital, um, what would that have meant for revenue? Would, would you have been able to do 50 million or 100 million this year instead of you know, your 22 million trailing? Um, uh, if you expanded into additional categories, uh, what would that have done to revenue? So you want to feel, make the investor feel like, yeah, I did 22 million last year, but had I addressed all these growth levers, it would have been a $100 million business last year. And with your capital, we're going to pull on these levers. And that's why it can be a multi $100 million business going forward, not even just $100 million revenue, but north of that. And so really good uh, topic here. I would have just said, quantify the impact in some way, and it would have really driven the point home. All right, here are the founders. Um, the first thing I notice about this slide is that they don't have traditional titles, which is which we'll discuss on the next slide, but you see um, some strong e-commerce experience, some domain experience, um, which, is, uh, which is always great. If you get to the next slide, um, it's interesting because Clint, Chris, and Jonathan have put themselves together. And so it does lend the question of who is running the company. And investors often get scared away by sort of a, a co-CEO or, or a trio running a business. So that, that begs some explanation. Uh, and then you don't see names underneath it. So it makes it actually look like this team is yet to be built, which may in fact be the case. Um, and, um, and so overall, I'm not sure that this slide helps because it uh, begs the question of leadership structure and it begs the question of you know, how deep the team is. Um, but that's, um, that's neither here nor there. I, I think if you want to show the broader team, it's better to show it when it's built out than when it's not. All right, back to financials, the historical revenue growth um, we've covered, but here's also the order account over time. What I do like about this slide, they're showing two plans going forward. They're showing uh, an internally funded plan and a VC funded plan. And it completely makes sense that these two are not the same. Um, and so I, I like the fact that they're making that delineation uh, for us. And, um, and I like the fact that even without us, the company is projecting to grow pretty aggressively. So. Uh, so a uh, good framing here. And then lastly, they talk about um, the overall investment they're looking to raise. If you look at the bottom point here, it says bootstrap, profitable, founder own, uh, growth, uh, growth at north of 300%. Um, actually, those are great points. They happen to fit very well with Felician's overall focus. And I would say that that could have even brought, been brought right up front. But Overall, that is, um, that's the Tree Center's deck. And as you can see, I think it's very clear and, and, and a job well done. All right, so let's recap the three key takeaways from the Tree Center's deck. Um, again, a great job overall on this deck, but uh, point number one is to make the success of your business seem inevitable. Uh, and the way you can do that is to position your business in sort of this macro secular shift that's happening no matter what. And to show in this instance, every category moving online every category having an online winner, every winner being a billion or multi-billion dollar business, and that you're gonna be that winner in this category. That would have driven home the point that your success is inevitable. Point number two is tactical, but I think it's important in your storytelling is to use trend line data when it supports your narrative over individual data points. The trend line gives the, gives the overall picture of backability, strength, 
predictability in that particular data point, whether it's CAC or gross margin or AOV or lifetime value. Um, if you have strong trend line data, show it because it enables the investor to underwrite against that. Uh, and then the third point is show that your business has many growth levers and that you don't have to pull all the levers perfectly for the company to be a, a wild success, that there's optionality there. So, uh, and then quantify those levers um, to help the investor understand what executing on them means for the business from a scale perspective. So those are my three suggestions from the Tree Center's deck. Once again, thank you to the Tree Center folks for, um, for working with us on this episode. And again, for all of you viewers out there, if you want to submit your, your pitch deck for consideration, you can do that at volitioncapital.com. And or you can, uh, if you want to watch other episodes, subscribe to this YouTube channel. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much.